Welcome, everybody. My name is Justin Bellamy. I'm the founder of the JB Media Group, and I'm the co-founder of the JB Media Institute. And this presentation is going to focus on 10 secrets to, macro to maximizing the Google Ad Grant Program or the Google Grant Program. Uh, before I jump into it, I wanted to preface that pretty much all of these best practices also apply to the standard Google Ads Program or the paid Google Ads Program. The reason why we put this class together is because the grant program is free. It offers up to $10,000 a month in free advertising for any 501c3 that qualifies. There are only a few um, organization types that do not qualify. Um, we're not going to go into all the, nits, the, the uh, nitty gritty about the program. We've done that before. We have lots of resources on our website for that as well. We want to talk today about the 10 best practices for getting the most out of the program. And like I said before, these also apply to paid Google ads as well. But the thing is that most nonprofits, because it's free, they often overlook some or all of these best practices. And therefore they often don't get much out of the program. They conclude that it's not effective. And oftentimes they let it lapse and um, don't ever fully realize the value. So we're gonna go through 10 different steps or, or things to consider to maximize it. And then we can talk about it at the end and answer questions. So we're going to cover specifically why keyword research is important at the front end of uh, setting up any Google Ads campaign. We're going to we're going to talk about the importance of Google Analytics and Tag Manager and how those tools um, play into success with the Google Grant. We're going to talk about why proper design matters for your pages where you're sending the traffic to. We're going to talk about the value of strategic content development for your landing pages. We're going to talk about how unlocking the conversion tracking will give you additional uh, targeting options and actually help you use your budget. We're going to talk about negative keywords. We're going to talk about some of the different ways people can use it beyond sometimes, sometimes organizations only think about Google Grant for a very specific narrow set of campaign ideas or keywords. We often find that thinking broader and also thinking more strategically is important. We're going to talk about why focusing on quality traffic over quantity of traffic is important for maximizing the program. We're going to talk about that creativity thing I just mentioned. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about why you shouldn't just turn this on and let it run, why having either someone internally or externally managing it at least every other month or at least once every three months and making changes and updating it will help you continue to get value out of the program long term. So the first um, thing we're going to talk about is keyword research. So any strong content strategy or pay-per-click campaign, and the Google Grant is a type of pay-per-click campaign, in my opinion, must begin with keyword research. Professional keyword research helps to set realistic expectations. If you know how many people are searching for certain things, you can expect to get 5 to 10% of those people to your website with the Google Grant. And if those numbers are really high, you can expect a lot of traffic. But if the keywords you're targeting are really, really low, you may get very little or no traffic at all. Um, Google Keyword Research can help you organize and guide your campaign structure. Um, it can inform what content needs to be developed and how that content should be optimized and so that it touches on the right words. And so here's an example. Um, this is for actually a proposal that we sent out last week for an, a regional nonprofit in New England um, in, the cons in the conservation space, specifically conservation law. And just to give you an idea, when I, quick, when I ran a quick report, their website already ranked for over 21,000 keywords. So just without even creating any new content, they had 21,000 different keyword opportunities that they could be potentially getting more traffic from if they leverage the Google Grant. Um, that's not even counting keywords that may be too competitive that they weren't in the top 100 for or they hadn't built content for yet, which of course, if we win that project, we will do a full research plan. We will combine their current rankings with new um, keyword research and we will provide a strategy for their organic search to move up higher and also for their Google Grant. So I just wanted to say like a lot of times you can just start with what you're currently ranking for and anything you're ranking below page two might be a good good fit for Google Grants, where it might be able to put you near the top with the Google Ads, the free Google Ads. 
So number two on the list is um, so conversion tracking. So it's critical you set up Google Analytics for and Google Tag Manager uh, to get the most out of the Google Grant Program. We'll talk about why later, but I just wanted to set that up front. This is an early step that a lot of organizations skip, especially the Tag Manager part. And with Tag Manager plus GA4, they work they work together. Um, GA4 is more of a tag and event oriented analytics system than the previous version of Google Analytics. And so having a tag manager set up, which is another free program from Google, where you can tag, it automatically tags a lot of user activity on a page and you can create custom tags. And then you can turn those tags into events, which can then be conversions. And then you can actually optimize your campaign for those conversions, which we'll talk about later. But because this is technical and requires more technical skills and what I would call like light programming or light development skills, a lot of nonprofits skip this step. And we think it's really wise to invest usually between like 500 and maybe 2000 to $3,000, depending on the complexity of your website, how many websites you have to get this set up correctly. It's a one-time thing for the most part. If your site is pretty much you know in a mature state where it has all of its main calls to action and conversions already on the site, you don't have to keep doing this over and over again. It's not um, something you have to continuously pay for or hire someone to do every year. It should be a one-time thing, maybe a little bit of tweaking with the professional support of a couple, um, you know, every time you make a major change to your site or you design a new site or you launch a new um, section of your site. But uh, for the most part, once it's set up, it, it'll, it'll just be good to go. And a lot of times it's overlooked in the launching of sites or especially for sites that were already um, built before GA4 came out last summer. So here's a really small nonprofit that we worked for uh, with a Google grant. And you can kind of, this might be hard to follow, but just with Tag Manager, we're, we're tracking um, page views, um, whether or not it was the first visit, whether or not the user was engaged, how far down they scrolled, whether they clicked on things, whether they started videos, whether they scrolled through 75% of the page, whether they finished the video, whether they signed up for the newsletter or whether they clicked on a link to YouTube. We're tracking all these things um, on one landing page for one really, really small nonprofit. This is a nonprofit with one volunteer staff person, no paid staff. Um, they raise money every time they need to do anything. So they raise money for this project. They raise money for the landing page that they need to add to the site. They raise money to pay a programmer a couple hundred dollars to set this up. And we were able to maximize their Google grant within a few months, getting $7,000 of traffic in just one month for free from Google ads, which constituted 70% of all the traffic to their website. So this investment they made in the Google grants pretty much changed their organization. And now we've trained them to manage it and they're doing it on their own with the one volunteer. So it doesn't mean a long-term investment, but you have to set it up correctly to get the value from it. And that's really the whole purpose of this presentation. So landing page design is also really important. There's oftentimes we see nonprofits that just have long blog posts with no real clear calls to action, just lots and lots of text. And those work well um, for the Google, uh, Google grant algorithm to be qualified to get traffic. But when traffic lands there, they might just read it and leave. They might never understand what your organization does. They might not know what free programs you're offering or what free free resources you're giving away or what how to get involved or any other things that are really important for your marketing and for collecting email addresses and for building your audience, which we'll talk more about later. So building the landing pages, and you can just really just design one template and you reuse it over and over again. You can even, we've done this for a lot of clients, we've redesigned their blog templates or their landing page templates of their entire website with one redesign so that all the pages have appropriate information about the organization so that anyone who lands there kind of basically learns the basics and knows what the next steps that the organization wants them to take are. So by doing this, by creating a more, a more engaging and interactive design, by building those pages that load quickly, which is also another step of proper landing page design, building fast loading pages that people, when people see the page loading for a long time, they'll click back and they'll click a different ad or a different uh, option and the design best practice is to make them, you know, um, feel welcome, um, feel the organization is professional, and also, like I said, showing showcasing the next steps people want to take, or they want them to take, 
are all part of one sort of best practice of making really professional pages. So adding videos and infographics can be helpful for this. Videos and infographics, people stop when they watch, and that increases the time on site, and that's a, a factor that Google considers in their algorithms. If you can add contact forms, ideally to things, to free resources people can download versus a simple newsletter sign up, people are more likely to give you their information to get something rather than to get future newsletters from an organization they don't know much about. So it's possible to build a little design element that's you can repeat on a bunch of pages that's like your, your best resource, or you can build a few of them if you have different resources for different sections of your site. You want to link here related content. So you want people to not just visit one page. You preferably want them to take multiple actions or sign up for something. That's the best case scenario or become a donor, but that usually doesn't happen their first visit. So figure out what that easy yes is and build your site to encourage those, those next steps. So here's an example. We work for a national recycling policy nonprofit. And this is their landing page for community recycling programs. If you search community recycling programs in Google, this page comes up number one, both an SEO and a Google grant opportunity. And you can't really see it very well from the scale I've got it scaled to, but the, these horizontal blue and green bars, and there's actually a few more of them. I, I just took the middle, the beginning and the end of the page, but there's a few more actually in between. So it alternates between blue and green, blue and green. Um, each one is a different call to action. They have a free resource. They have a toolkit. They have a grant program that gives grants to communities to start their own community recycling programs. And then they have um, a free like resource library for this for this industry or segment. Um, so as you scroll on the page, every after every major section, there is a, a something, there's an action you can take. Um, you can sign up, for, you can download the free toolkit. You can go learn about the application program for the grant. Um, you can get, put yourself on the waiting list to, for the next grant application cycle. You can um, down, you can join their online community where there's a library of resources and other people who launch community programs. Basically three or four things you can do, which are related to this page, which is a guide or best practices overview of creating a community recycling program. So the giving away free education and giving really clear direction on what hopefully people who are interested in this can do. And the different calls to action kind of relate to different audiences. So sometimes a HOA president wants to create a program for their HOA or their apartment building. Other times it's a community activist at a nonprofit that wants to do a community recycling program and spearheaded that. And other times it's a government person working for the city or county who is tasked with rolling out or researching a community recycling program. The different calls to action are relevant to different audiences. And so the table of contents at the top helps people find the content that's relevant to them. The call to action below that is relevant to them. It's all really well thought out, strategic. This is like a three month process, planning this out, creating this content, getting it up. Now it's number one in Google. And they're getting, you know, they're getting all the traffic for this topic. So the next topic is, um, sorry, um, look, moving, the, moving the, the controls there, I can see it. So the value of creating quality content, I think that last example shows it. If, you call, if, your, if your content is strong enough, it goes to number one in Google, you might not even need to use the Google grant or a Google ad campaign you might actually get 30 to 50% of all the traffic organically, and you can save your resources for Google Grant for something else. In this client case that I just shared, they got number one for community recycling programs and number one for a topic called circular packaging. Circular packaging is a subtopic of a bigger topic of the circular economy, which is too competitive for them. So maybe their circular, their, their Google Grant should be used for that more competitive keyword. And maybe in the case of recycling programs, there's a more competitive general keyword they can use the grant for because they've, they've nailed number one on both of those other topics for through organic content. And the reason is because when we created the content, we optimized it. We weren't sure how high it would go. So we just went for the top and we happened to, in that case happened to get top positions, but that doesn't always happen. So we want to create the content with the goal of high ranking. And the truth of the matter is the same steps to get a high ranking on Google organically are the same steps to for a page to do really, really well in the algorithms for Google for the Google grant. So if you do a really good job with the content, it'll perform, it'll, it'll be prepared to perform well in the Google grant if it doesn't do well enough in organic 
to kind of void that opportunity. So your content must match your keywords. Google uses a complicated algorithm. They use separate algorithms, but they're similar for both programs, for organic and for paid. So you want to just go after the right um, different keywords, which is a separate topic than this. But um, we can talk about that another time. We have presented on that other times, how to choose the right keywords and things like that. But if you understand that process, it applies for Google Grants. Another thing to consider is you cannot use one landing page for all your Google, Google ad groups. And you shouldn't use your homepage as a catch-all because your homepage usually is just the front door. It's the general overview of your organization. It probably doesn't go into it much detail about these niche competitive keywords, not to enough detail to really appeal to either of Google's algorithms. So while the homepage can work for certain campaigns, like people looking for you by your name or um, maybe one keyword for one group, you want to have different pages for all the other advertising groups, which have a group of related keywords in them. And that also help you with the organic ranking for those same keywords. So that kind of to summarize, creating the right content helps you appeal to both the paid algorithm and the search algorithm. And as a bonus, you might want to consider doing the project as one combining your organic SEO and your Google grant effort into one project, whether that's internal, outsourced to an agency or specialist, or a hybrid where you work together with an agency or specialist to do it and train you how to keep it going yourself. Any of those three options are, are very viable, uh, depending on your skill set you have in-house with these types of things I'm talking about. But it's really um, because the keyword research can be done once, because the content development plan can be done once, it saves you time and resources to kind of combine these two different strategies together. And in my experience, some nonprofits can't really justify SEO and they can't really justify Google grants, but potentially if you combine them together, the money will go farther and you can justify doing both, especially with that Google grant there to help guarantee that some traffic. So earlier when I showed the um, conversion case study, that actually, that organization is a rare case. They only have one landing page for their Google grant. It is a new page. We designed, we helped them design this. They actually wrote it themselves. They actually designed it themselves, but we kept giving them feedback, rounds of feedback on the content and the design. And then we helped, we, we hired a subcontractor to set up all the tagging and, and conversion tracking. Then we were hired to do the grant for a few months and then we trained them. So their goal was to get more people to watch their video. They were, they got a grant to produce a documentary film and some short films and the whole, they, now they have these films and no one's, they're not really being found very often. So they wanted to build a marketing campaign for their films. So the films are about a rare um, condition called, scler excuse me, called a scleroderma, which is a, a rare genetic condition that is uh, most often um, eventually fatal. And the founder of the organization, her mom passed away from this, this condition. So she, she, she's created this nonprofit to share information about research, about how to lengthen your life if you have it and, and how to um, find resources when you have it because it's very confusing and, and scary when you get these kind of diagnoses. So the film is about that. And this landing page is getting all her Google grant traffic and starting to move up organically as well, bringing more attention to the film and other things related to it. So we've been talking about this, but when you have relevant conversions, they are not just a nice tactic to have, they unlock one of the most beneficial advanced targeting and bidding strategies that Google Grants allow. When you have conversions um, tracked and connected to your Google Ads campaign from your analytics, usually using Tag Manager, as I mentioned before, that creates a scenario where you can unlock higher bids, so paying more for click, per clicks, which gives you higher positions on competitive keywords. And then also it allows you to turn on a, an AI version of targeting, which says optimize for conversions. What that does is it allows Google to track which keywords and which even demographics of people are most likely to take the actions you're tracking and show the ad more often to those keywords and those people dynamically and automatically. And that is extremely powerful in unlocking more impressions, more clicks, higher bidding, 
which means higher positions for your ads. All those things are often what's necessary for a Google grant to go from spending zero to two thousand dollars a month to reaching those five to ten, to, you know, five, seven, ten thousand dollar per month utilization. The way the Google grant works is it's a credit that's daily. And if you don't spend it, you don't keep it, doesn't roll over. So in a day, if a day goes by and you spend ten dollars, if you do that every day for the month, you're gonna spend three hundred. If you spend $200 a day, you're going to spend about $6,000 in the month. And ultimately, your goal is to spend the entire $330 every single day utilizing the full $10,000. If that happens, we'll get into strategies later to maximize it. But the first goal is actually get yourself to full utilization. And this is one of the most important steps. And it requires that technical setup that I talked about earlier. It also is helpful if you have really well-designed pages with really clear calls to action that people actually take because it only works if people complete the conversion and Google can track it. If it has a conversion on it, but no one's doing it, this, this doesn't enable this. You have to have, I think, 15 conversions a month across your account before you can flip a switch and turn this advanced option on. So you have, well, ideally you have multiple conversions tracked. Some maybe they can just indicate people are enjoying the content and others that they're taking those more advanced actions that you're tracking, like signing up for programs, downloading resources, making a donation, things like that. So now we've kind of gone over the basics. If you just nail all those things we talked about so far, you're going to have the successful Google grant, most likely, and also potentially great organic traffic as well. So now we're going to go into some slightly more advanced tactics and kind of more general mindset and strategic thinking elements to take it to the next level. One of those is to build a negative keyword list. So it, because the Google grant is free, most organizations and even some professionals that I've seen, actually quite a few, default to what I consider lazy Google ads optimization. Lazy optimization means all you care about is getting the most clicks. And unless it's fully maxed out, you don't use the different tactics to get the best quality traffic. And one of those tactics is the negative keyword list. So you can add a keyword list that if any of those words in the negative list appear, in the search query, it will um, block the ad from appearing. And so for a lot of organizations, there are some topics that are similar to their name or similar to what they do, but they're actually nothing to do with what they do. You don't want your ad to show up for those things. People might accidentally click it. They might be confused um, and they might click and start using your budget. And those kind of people are not gonna stay on your site. You're not what they were looking for. You don't want to waste your budget, whether it's paid ads or, or free ads. This is more. This is always used in paid ads because in paid ads you're trying to save every cent, every cent you can. But with free Google ads, people often overlook this. So here's a quick example. We do uh, Google grants for an organization called B Lab. B Lab is nothing to do with honeybees. It has all to do with B is in benefit benefit corporation, um, which is a type of business that's um, set up their mission as a for profit for the good of the the planet, the environment, and, and people. So it's a certification, sort of like organic certification for businesses. And there are a lot of keywords that are kind of interestingly similar. A lot of them have to do with, with um, bees and other things like that. And there's other, lots of others as well. This is, I just took a screenshot, it happened to be a section of their negative keyword list that had a lot to do with bees and also keywords related to like free and cheap, which we just want to eliminate because they're really wanting to get people there for their educational content, starting their certification program, um, downloading their resources, things like that. So this is just a list um, and this much, much longer, I think it's 700 different words we've added. And oftentimes what we'll do is we'll spend a couple of minutes or a couple hours every month or every two months scouring the all the keywords that actually received clicks and then handwriting a list of things on there that we don't want to be known for, going to the negative list and adding those in. Um, so that it's constantly improving. Like the, the negative keyword list can constantly improve over time. And the more it improves, the better quality the, the keyword list where they're, that are getting clicks will become over time. So now we're talking a little bit more about how to use the program. So for a lot of organizations, it makes sense to go after a new topic, build a new piece of content and la launch a new Google grant campaign or, or keyword ad group for that new page, basically creating a whole new source of traffic. And that can be done every month or can be done once a year, depending on the size of the organization and the resources. 
But Google Grants can actually be a way to get in front of entirely new people who aren't finding you at all right now. And that's one of the coolest things about it is because for those new pieces of content, if you just create the content alone, it may never be found. If you're lucky, it'll also show up organically and maybe even get the number one position, but it's not guaranteed. So the Google Grant helps you guarantee the traffic, if you, especially if you pick the keywords using a good strategy. So it helps you build your audience. So it can help you with thought leadership, whether that's your existing core topics or even emerging or new ones. It can help you promote reports, research, and if you have paid programs, it's great for keywords related to what people might be searching for if they want to buy the kind of program you're offering. Um, so whenever possible, it's best, as we talked about before, to capture people's you know, contact information because that then they're, they're then they're permanently a part of your newsletter or email list. And they also downloaded something that they mentally attribute to your organization. So they have more affinity, they have more brand awareness, and then they're also on your list. If they like what you provided, they might join your programs, they might tell friends or colleagues, they might attend your events, they might donate to your organization, depending on your structure and what your goals are. But you're not going to get any of those things if you don't get people looking for the right topics to your site and you don't capture them somehow. So this is a kind of another level of depth with the negative keyword list. The negative keyword list is just one of the tactics necessary to improve the quality of your traffic from Google Grants. So as I said before, lazy optimization and most organizations and some professionals by default will focus on utilization and maximizing number of clicks. But sometimes the keyword with the most clicks aren't relevant enough. And so you might get a lot of clicks and only a tiny percentage of those people actually are looking for what you have. All the rest leave immediately and you're just burning up your budget on what we call low quality traffic or traffic that didn't even really intend to end up on a site that offers what you offer or has the programs or mission that you have. So while it can make sense in the very beginning to just go broad and try to get as much traffic as you can, to reach utilization or full utilization of the program, once you reach that, it doesn't mean you're done. And even if, and sometimes it makes sense to just not even go for full utilization from the beginning, go for quality from the very beginning, meaning choose keywords that are actually relevant. And that what that really comes down to is putting yourself mentally in the mind of someone searching. If they're searching for this, are we where they want to end up? Do we have something for them? Do we have page for them, a program for them, content for them, um, education for them. Why would they want to be on our site? If the answer is they shouldn't be on our site, you shouldn't target that keyword. There's no value. Even though you might get some free traffic, you're just burning up your web resources. You're, you're burning up potentially staff time if they ask inappropriate questions you have to respond to um, or you know all the other things that can come along with traffic you don't want on your site. Um, so you want to go for quality over over um, quantity and qual both within number of clicks and also how to utilize that budget, the free budget. So you, well, another thing you can do is as you're starting to run campaigns and keywords, you have lots of stuff happening in your account. You can start looking for those low quality keyword, the keywords that are driving low quality traffic. So keywords that are sending low time on site or high bounce rate, Keywords that are not converting at all. You have over 200 clicks on the keyword and there's zero conversions. Maybe it's not the right keyword. Um, and you can also look at the keyword list and see what's not relevant and either remove that keyword or add an appropriate negative keyword that helps restrict the variations of that topic that are not relevant. So another thing is, that's important, a lot of organizations miss opportunities like they just run only campaigns that are evergreen only campaigns that are year-round that are about things that they're always talking about but sometimes current events or a big thing in politics or the news cycle a topic emerges that's really interest is really popular for a few weeks or a few months and then it fades from from people's interest and one of the most important things you can do with the google grant is jump on those opportunities because a lot of times if they're very short term, 
most organizations aren't going after them with the Google grant or paid Google ads. And you can get really cheap, a lot of really cheap clicks while it's a really, really popular topic. So as an example of this, I can give you a couple of different examples. Um, election coverage for nonprofit news channels is really big. They have really cutting edge coverage of specific controversies or specific topics. They can put the Google grant up and get their content at the top. We've done it. We've had an organization that did this in 2020 election and got their campaign went through the roof. And I'll show that, that graph in a minute. But also uh, for my father's organization, which was a nonprofit in the health sector, there was a documentary film that came out that was that kind of went viral. Millions of people saw it in theaters. And it featured a couple of different um, doctors. And then it was covered on CNN and the, the news like three or four times. Um, doctors that had worked with Bill Clinton on his heart condition. So we created a page about Bill Clinton and his heart condition, put it in the Google ads and CNN and, and Huffington Post and all these big media sites were burying our own site, but the Google ads let us get above them and get lots and lots and lots of really cheap clicks because no one else was going after that keyword. No one else had a commercial reason to. We happened to have all the those doctors from the documentary and from the interviews on our in our conference. And so if you want to come learn more about how Bill Clinton healed himself, best place to do it was our conference. We're the only conference with all the doctors that were in the interview in one place. So don't just set it and forget it. Uh, launch new campaigns for new initiatives, programs, partnerships, time-sensitive issues, mainstream news, political events, seasonal events, things like that. Um, and here's an example. So this organization was kind of running along pretty steady, uh, getting, you know, um, a couple hundred clicks a week, a little less than a thousand. And then all of a sudden around the election, they went way up. Their usage of their budget didn't really change very much. The yellow line is budget, the blue line is clicks. You can see that their clicks went through the roof for a couple of weeks and then just came back down. This was all because they went after some news related time-sensitive topics related to the 2020 election and their coverage of it for Western North Carolina. And so they got lots of clicks for that short period of time, and then it tended to die down. We've seen the same kind of graph come up for like seasonal events at nonprofits that have event, event fundraisers, other things like that, where there's lots of search around the holidays for their event, and then it drops off. They can get a lot of that traffic if they have the grant set up correctly. So last one I think this is, um, you don't want to just the kind of going along with the last one. Not only do you have short-term opportunities, but sometimes your long-term priorities change. Sometimes you, you know, change your mission. Sometimes you launch new programs or sunset old programs. Sometimes your whole goals can change. You want to adjust your strategy for Google ads and for, for paid search. Anytime those change. So you want to have a process where someone is taking, you know, at least once a year, ideally three or four times a year, taking a look at those things and um, and making those changes. Also, if you don't make any changes for 90 days, if no one logs into your account for 90 days, Google will automatically pause it. That's not a big deal unless no one's paying attention and they can go pause for months or years. Um, this often happens when the person managing it leaves and they don't train the new person or no one remembers that they were managing this program and that goes dormant or things like that can happen. Or some, some organizations use interns or volunteers to manage it. And then those people leave and then no one manages it. And then even if it's set up perfectly after 90 days, it's going to just turn itself off and you can turn it right back on. But if no one does that, it's just going to stay off and you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunity and traffic. So that's my whole presentation. Uh, looks like we have a little bit less than 15 minutes left. Um, we'd love to um, take some questions. Justin, we've got one question in here from Peter, um, could you just, uh, I'll pull the link and share it, but can you share a little bit about the sign up process? Like what do they have to do if they sign up? And I'm going to share the link for how they can um, go and check it out. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a little bit removed from the process right now, but um, I've been following it because it's changed recently. And uh, we have, we've been testing the new process and we have some new clients that are going through their sign up right now. So it's a, several step process, but it's not that not very involved. It's not, you don't have to write a grant application. You just have to confirm your eligibility. And that's a two-step process, I believe. The first step is joining the Google for Nonprofits program. Everyone who's eligible for the Google for Nonprofits is automatically eligible for the Google grant. So what you need to do is first is getting get enrolled in the Google for Nonprofits. 
And I believe it's just like a one page application. You put in um, your, your EIN, your mission statement, um, maybe a link to some sort of like repository of annual reports or something like that. Yeah, I think you might have to upload some specific standard 501c3 annual reports. Um, and then there's a third party vendor that verifies that you are a 501c3 and you don't fall into any of the disqualification categories, which are primarily for hospitals and higher ed or private schools are two of the main categories that don't qualify. So hospitals that are nonprofits or health providers that are non nonprofits that provide paid health services or schools that sell um, that charge students, whether those are you know private from like private preschools up to private colleges, those are not not eligible. But you have you don't have you the, the third party verifies that based on your application, which is primarily just the things I just mentioned. And I think you have to like put in a little maybe a, a paragraph or two how you plan to use the program, which is just like a list of the things you want to promote. It could be topics, it could be programs, it could be offerings, it could be content, education. And that's just, you know, I think usually less than 300 words. Um, that's the way it used to be. It may have changed a little bit, but once you're approved for Google for um, nonprofit program, then you're, um, you can set up a Google grant inside of there and you have to create a couple of ad groups and a couple of campaigns and a couple of ads and then you request that to be reviewed. And then once that's approved, you can go in and start making changes and expanding the program. But it's basically two, two, two major steps. There's a waiting period while they're, they're verifying it. They just changed verification providers. So that's slowing things down. There's also, it seems that there's less staff at Google Ads. Um, so there's less people, like they're a little bit less responsive to questions or concerns or when things kind of uh, when you get rejected for an unknown reason, and they can reject you for if your site has is super slow or has malware on it or other technical things. And that's often the hardest to, to, to diagnose. And that's usually when we bring in advanced outside support for our own team. When we see that it's happened a few times this the last 12 months, at least two where a nonprofit was rejected, not because they weren't eligible, because their site didn't meet some quality guidelines. And hey, I just wanted to share um, with everyone in the chat, I shared the link um, for how to get started. I shared the elig eligibility requirements. And I also shared a great video that Google put out about how to get started, just to give you some more detailed information. Um, the next question we have is from Eric. He just wanted to confirm that a 501c6 nonprofit, like a CVB or DMO, are they eligible or not eligible for this type of thing? They're not eligible, no, no exceptions. Well, I will say with CVBs, however, um, we work with a few CVBs not to do it themselves, but for the CVB to provide resource support for their largest tourism nonprofits in their community to get the grant. Because the grant can be used to promote general tourism keywords, like things to do in your region, things to do near the ne next city over, things like that. And so we've done it for arboretums, for museums, for aquariums, for heritage areas, for botanical gardens, um, for historical associations, and also regional nonprofits that are 501c3s, which like most heritage areas, which are a lot of those in the country, state or federal heritage areas are, are eligible. And so we often do it for those organizations directly, but in two or three cases, we've had a DMO that said, why would we want to spend $10,000 on Google ads when this flagship nonprofit can receive it for free we will grant them a little money to run the program, and then we will guide some of the strategies so it benefits the DMO as well. So the DMO can like help produce some new content for the nonprofit site that maybe is a summary of things to do in their area, featuring that organization first, but also linking back to key pages in the DMO website, like you know maybe the whole um, outdoor activities section or the whole um, downtown guide for that that destination or region. There's a way to get the traffic to the nonprofit, let them benefit from it first, and then feed some back to the DMO. But it, the grant actually has to go through the nonprofit, the 501c3. Great, thanks. Eric was just thanking you too in the in the Q and A. Um, we have Rose from Conserving Carolina. Um, she was saying that it seems like the examples that you give include a lot of organizations that have an educational or an advocacy mission, often nationwide. Um, when she thinks about Google Grants, she mostly dismisses it because she's not sure what they would use the traffic for. They want web traffic interested in local conservation projects, 
programs and volunteering. Do you see that Google Grants could be potentially valuable for smaller, more regional or local organizations like that? Potentially, it all depends on if there's enough search for those keywords in your area and how big of a geographic area you feel comfortable targeting. So the client we just, I showed in the keyword research example at the beginning, they're a multi-state conservation organization out of, I think, Massachusetts, or I believe they're out of Boston. And so for them, they're like targeting, you know, Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, a few other states. There's plenty of search up there for the, and they're also covering a lot of different categories of conservation. They do ocean stuff, they do plastics, they do um, zero waste, and they do energy. And so for them, it's like super easy to utilize the whole thing. Lots of relevant topics, not even including volunteerism. Um, if you're in a bigger city, but a small region like Asheville, there is enough search for conservation and enough search for volunteering for it to make sense. You might not use all the grants, um, but you also can use it to tap into when there's like a like a disaster, like let's say Duke Energy spills some pollution and there's a bunch of people looking for it. You can target that and you can get a bunch of people to join your organization all at once, get on your donor list, get on your, your subscriber list. So there are definitely uses for it. You just should have realistic expectations. That's where the keyword research comes in. You can get through the research and get a clear idea. You can spend maybe a thousand to two thousand dollars on research. And then you can know if it's worth the time to set it up because you know how people are searching for your your topics in your region. If you're in a really rural area and you're only doing like a county or a few counties, it probably won't make sense. But if you're near a city with at least 30 or 50,000 people, it might make sense. It's just, it's not a yes or no. It's like a, it's worth exploring, worth looking into kind of a thing. Great. Well, we have a few more minutes. So if there's any, and Rose was just saying thank you as well. If there's any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or um, drop them in the Q&A. And we are glad to answer them. One question I just wanted to throw out as we're wrapping up, Justin, is, you know, you were just kind of alluding to the idea that sometimes you have to sort of investigate before you decide that this is the right thing. Do you have any yeah. tips for people on how they sort of investigate um, I mean, again, I shared the links, um, but, you know, I was talking to some of the other JB Media Group team members, and I know um, Peter was suggesting that it's worth it to go and sort of look at Google Grants and watch some of the stuff they have. Just curious if you have, for especially the new people who haven't even begun to dip their toes in, like, what's the best way to sort of get started? Well, if you're in the category of, I don't know if there's enough if, I'm, if, if you're an organization that's like in a small region, in a non very populated region, and you're, or you're on a really, really niche topic, you can, you, the, the question is, is it worth it to put in the time and resources to, to, to set up a grant and then manage it? And the step to do that is actually keyword research, like the number one, you know, best practice number one in this presentation. And that is, if you're on the fence about it, it's relatively hard for a novice researcher to de determine uh, like if it's a good fit or not, because most novice researchers don't think broadly enough or do the right strategic lenses to like identify all the opportunities. Um, and keyword thinking about keywords, if you're like embedded in an organization, you usually think about them in a pretty narrow, sometimes a restrictive way. So it may make sense if you think it might be worth it and you have a little bit of resource to outsource the research, which is a, you know, like I said, can be a one to $2,000 project. If that's too much money, then you might not be able to make a really a professional uh, decision. You have to maybe do it yourself. Um, part of that is also having the right tools. So we have professional tools that cost like $200 a month to use that we can use for our clients. Um, and that allows us to get all the data that we need to make those decisions. Without those pro tools, it's very hard to get the, enough data. Um, Google has some free tools for people who are already inside of Google Ads. So if you set up an account, but don't take the time to actually build it out, you can use their tools, which are pretty helpful, but they're not as useful as the ones we use. We use a tool called Ahrefs, which is ahrefs.com about $200 a month, super, you know, geeky data analytics for research. And it's provides more data than you can possibly need. We, we export it all and then get rid of some of it for our present for our clients when we're doing this kind of work. If you're national and you have 
topic people are looking for, it's almost always a, a good fit. Regional, some fit, you know, in between, yeah, yes and a no, and research can be helpful.